Yeah, so I'm going to talk about, uh, which I'm going to ask a question to all of you, and perhaps you can guide me in terms of some experiments I might like to try and do in the future. So um, I've been interested in whether we can probe dynamics beyond the Schrodinger equation, testing the, the superposition principle. So if we start off by uh, what actually... So, so what actually triggered this question? Um, actually, it was a paper I read uh, um, a number of years ago. It's uh, based on, someone was talking about sorting there. Yeah. So it's based on some of the work of sorting. Um, <coughs> so if we, if we think about just a, a sort of schoolboy model of, of quantum mechanics, we have some dynamical equation, the solution of which we call the wave, uh, the wave function. Um, we have some linear superpositions. If I have multiple paths, I can just sum these things up and describe it by some bigger wave function for the whole thing. But of course, we can't actually measure the wave function in real life, not in a, in a real experiment. All we ever measure is the probability, which we relate to Born's rule in this one. So there's a, a sort of intimate relation between uh, um, quantum mechanics and electromagnetism. So you can write down a, a wave equation, which is very similar to the Schrodinger equation for, for electromagnetic fields. Uh, and we talk about it in the same way. So the, the electric field sum up, and then the intensity is the, the square of the electric field, right? But the superposition principle in electromagnetism is violated all the time. So whenever you have some nonlinear medium, uh, um, this happens all the time. So parametric down conversion or just some birefringent crystal or, or something like this. Um, <coughs> when it comes to the probability, uh, maybe this is obvious. I, I don't know, but it seems slightly odd to me that the, the, the square of the wave function, uh, no matter how... So, so you have information about all these different paths somehow. And no matter how far apart different paths are, there's only ever a relation between two at a time. So you can always write it down as the sum of these different paths. So if I think about some three-path interferometer to A, B, and C, even though A and C are further apart than either B to C or B to A, you never get some mixing term between all three of them. So, so this was the original paper that, that, that kind of uh, uh, triggered me to start thinking about these things. So this is a, a, a group in, in Waterloo, um, and they were motivated by this, this Sorkin parameter uh, um, to measure it using light. Right? So, so they set up a, a multi-path interferometer, which is just three slits labeled A, B, and C. Each slit is, is, has an opening of um, A, little a, and they're separated by distance D. Um, <coughs> so this is effectively a, a three-slit version of Young's, Young's experiment. And then what they did is they, they had some mask that they would move in front of the, the, the slits, and they wanted to compare um, whether... I don't know why this doesn't change. They wanted to, to compare whether the, the probability when you have all three slits are open is consistent with the sum of all the, the different paths that you can get. Uh, and so this kappa here... Well, you can see the kappa there. So that's this sorting parameter that, that according to sort of conventional quantum mechanics, Born's rule, etc., uh, is always zero. Right. And in their first experiment, they actually measured a violation, but then they, they uh, came along and they, well, a number of other people as well, there have been five or six different experiments now using coherent states, single photons, um, light with angular momentum, NMR states, have been quite a few different experiments, all testing effectively the same kappa parameter. So, I... When I read this paper, I was somewhat confused that I <coughs> realized I didn't understand Borden's rule at all or, or, or where it comes from. And after doing a bit more reading, I was reassured that it seems it's not obvious why it has to be this way. Right? Um, but there is one thing that, at least to me as an experimentalist, seems somewhat obvious. So whenever I have a, a, a wave equation of that form, it's true that the mod square integrated over space is always one. Right? To an experimentalist like myself, that seems kind of remarkable. Maybe it's not, but it, it, it seems to be true. Um, that is unless you take into account the, the details of the boundary conditions that you have in, in, in your experiment. Um, or, of course, you can, you can modify the, the wave equation so that it doesn't satisfy that, that general form. Um, <coughs> and so, in terms of the boundary conditions, there are these, these things people have started to think about recently called... Um, they, they refer to them as Feynman paths. I uh, don't know whether I agree fully with that description. 
But the idea is that if you've got a, a triple slit experiment, rather than just having these classical paths that, that go through that some integer number of slits, um, you can have these curved trajectories and, and, and so on. Um, so it, it, the, these come out from sort of high order corrections to the, the path integral formula. Um, and if you work it out, then they're, uh, first of all, these, these loop trajectories are all very heavily suppressed. Um, but they scale as sort of lambda to the three over two divided by the product of the, the slit width to the <coughs> square root of the separation. So lambda would is what? Lambda is the wavelength. Yeah. Or for mass waves, the de Broglie wavelength. <coughs> so uh, I'll come back to this at the end. But if you wanted to do this with mass waves and make it as big as possible, you'd want to, want to go for something very light and very cold or very very low velocity. So a BC of lithium or, or mm -hmm. something. This is kind of, uh, when I first saw this, I thought it was a little bit out there um, until they did the experiment. So there's a group in India uh, led by Simha <coughs> who've actually done this with uh, micro photons. Um, so they actually do it in a field um, out in the middle of nowhere. No, yeah, so the, the bottom right is a picture. Right? It's, yeah, you, you know, exactly. uh, um, it's a beautiful experiment. So they, they don't quite do it with slits. They have these absorbing slots. Um, it's effectively a three-slit experiment when you mm -hmm. compare the, the difference in the different kind. Uh, incidentally, if any, any student ever complains about a task that you give them, the student that collected this data on, on the top here lives for a month in a field in the jungle in India. And actually, they don't talk about it in the paper, but having spoken to them, a systematic is uh, um, scorpions running across the experiment. So they have these giant uh, scorpions that obviously are about the wavelength of one of their microwave photos. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really something that they have to take into account, right? Uh, um, but it seems like whether or not you think of it as these loop trajectories or, or some sort of boundary condition that's changing, it seems that kappa in the sort of naive application of the um, superposition principle isn't actually always zero. You can you can really measure violations of this. Right? So this is if these extra <coughs> parts were taken into account. Is that the idea that that's exactly they right. somehow change the yeah, exactly. So I mean, in principle, you could look very very closely at, at the interference pattern, yeah. and you could say this deviates from what I expect. But of course, in an experiment, I mean, in fact, I can't think of any precision experiment where you measure the amplitude of something. You always you always convert it to a frequency to measure it. Yeah. So here, in order to measure the amplitude in a reasonably good way, yes. you do this common mode thing. You compare different mm, interactions of slits so that you always know that the, the number of particles you have coming through is representative of what's really there. So there's an unspoken assumption in the, the Sorkin formulation, which is to go from Born's rule to this decomposition of the three-slit pattern into the two-slit patterns. You assume that psi A, psi B, and psi C all have definite values that don't depend on whether or not the other slits are open. Yes. The reality is if you open slot C, that changes psi A and psi B because of the boundary conditions. And that's why this kappa is non-zero, even though Born's rule is so correct. And of course, this is, this is for a classical theory, right? This is, this is microwaves. They're just coming out of the horn. I mean, the calculations... Um, yes. Everything is fun. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but uh, 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 I can just write. Yeah, you're still interfering one photon at a time. This is true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, but uh, what I mean is, I don't have a, uh, I don't have a Fox state because just yeah. a, there's a horn that I yes, like, yes. apply to or whatever, and it just sends out some. Yeah. All this fast integral is just uh, you can calculate otherwise. It's just maybe more efficient. Uh, more well, simpler way. Uh, if you uh, solve Schrodinger equation properly, you get psi square, and you measure and you find psi square. It's all <coughs> just if you're naive, if you make it naive and incorrect, not complete. precise calculations, then uh, completely agree. So all this is just, uh, I don't know, all these papers. Sorry, and all this work is just <laughs> that if you do some naive calculation and yeah. you don't take into account uh, this boundary condition properly. Uh, um. I think a lot of people do a lot of naive calculations, so it's already interesting to see that this is uh, yes. uh, something you can measure, right? I mean, this is a sorry, sorry, no, I don't want to interrupt. I was just going to say this is a measurable effect, right? It's quite significant uh, uh, under the correct conditions. Uh, and just a question: Why do you need three slits for this? You can fix them in some other two. Um, how are you going to see if there's any? So. Um, if you just have two slits, you can only have around the two. Yeah, yeah. Just yes. slips around the two and then goes through. But, uh, but, but what would you test? The, the contradiction here is between trying to decompose the, the triple into all the pairs 
Right. So you need some comparison to do to see that that effect is in there. Right. And composing a pair into singles is not. That doesn't that doesn't tell you the same thing, does it? No. Because, still, because Boyd's rule is quadratic, you exactly. can't. You'd never get, you'd never get a right. term above just the two-path no, product. Well, so, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but if you, had, if you just had it going round yeah, and round and round yeah, through, yeah, yeah. each loop is even more suppressed yeah, than the previous yeah, one, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it just becomes yes. harder, harder yeah. to measure. Um, yeah. So, um, <coughs> having looked at uh, their experiments, um, I started to think to myself, well, how could it be that this is not true for... Uh, any system. I mean, the dynamics, just solving the dynamical equation irrespective of whether it's quantum mechanics or anything else, it always has this probability probability that psi squared integrated over ruler space is equal to 1. Um, and to get a different normalization, so to be able to solve that equation and not have it equal to 1, I need to change the dynamics in some way. Um, and if I think back to classical electromagnetism, just by having nonlinear dynamics, then I can have it whereby that norm is not preserved, right? Mm -hmm. it doesn't exist um, and uh, <coughs> maybe not an obvious way to do it, but what maybe it is obvious, I don't know. Whenever people try to describe quantum systems, including gravity, there always seems to be some nonlinear interaction to the sort of dynamical equation that we use to describe the system. Whether or not you believe it's true, whether or not you can test it, I don't know, but it always seems to introduce some sort of nonlinearity. I should caveat that by saying um, I also was in Vienna at the time, and uh, I had a molecule interferometer lying around. It seemed like a fairly um, reasonable thing to, to, to do. So here, here's our version of the experiment, um, the guys in uh, Canada with, with, with photons. So we start with a, um, <coughs> a glass plate covered in some molecules. These are thalassiamine or PCH2. They have a mass of about 500 um, atomic mass units. We have a, a a blue laser, tightly focused to about a micron, um, impinges on the surface of these molecules um, and gives them just enough energy to launch into some big plume. Um, I haven't shown it there, but there's a, a series of slits to just enforce some sort of transverse coherence on the of this beam. Uh, we raster, so the, the laser source stays fixed, and then we raster the, the source of molecules relative to that fixed point so that the plume always starts to sink. Then we have a diffraction mask uh, um, consisting of a series of single, double, and triple slits. Uh, it's about 58 centimeters away from the source. And then a meter further down, we have some um, glass screen where the molecules land. They stick, they stay there forever. Um, we illuminate them with a the laser, they fluoresce a bit, and we just collect these, these photons. So, um, each quanta, or each massive quanta stuck on the screen actually gives us many, many detection events. So the, the, the fluorescence yield is, is really high compared to the number of molecules that's in the surface. So one thing to bear in mind about our experiment compared to um, the, the, what the photon guys have done is, well, you have to, well, first of all, no coherent source of, or there's no easy way to get a coherent source of molecules. Um, you just have to enforce this using slits. Um, and our diffraction slits are much, much harder to make than theirs. So their, their typical slit width is on the order of tens of microns, whereas ours is on the order of uh, 80 nanometers, which is kind of difficult to make. Um, it's also hard to get, um, because you have to constantly narrow the, the molecular beam um, so that you have a high enough transverse coherence to illuminate multiple slits at once and actually see anything in the first place, you're always reducing the number of molecules that you have, and that's always going to reduce the sensitivity to which you can measure them, just through, through shot noise. Mm -hmm. So we had to elongate our slits. So uh, as you can see on the left there, in figure A, it's actually a series of um, as near to identical as we can make them slits one on top of the other. So that in the transverse direction, or sorry, rather in the vertical direction, um, you just get that much more count. It's just, it's just a signal to noise trick. So here are some example uh, um, interference patterns that we recorded. So the one on the left doesn't show up so clearly, uh, mm -hmm. but that's a single slit diffraction. So it's from one, one single 80 nanometer um, slit. Then we have a couple of double slit diffraction patterns. Um, you can see that the, the sort of bright fringes you see here um, have a different period. Uh, it's just because they have a different separation. So the, the B, if you like, if these are my three slits, uh, would be equivalent to this. And then the C would be equivalent to this. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and then the triple slit um, on, the, on the right there looks exactly the same as the double slit because of course the separation between adjacent ones is the same, but it's a lot brighter because I have uh, an extra third flux arriving. Um, I should say that each one of these interference patterns takes about a day to record. So it's kind of uh, troublesome to, to get good statistics on, on, on this kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> yeah, so Marcus uh, spoke a little bit yesterday about how you uh, sort the molecules based on um, their position on the screen and tells you what the, the velocity of the interfering particles was. So to go into a little bit more detail, um, we can measure that uh, by looking at the separation between the fringes. So uh, on the top left there I have um, <coughs> I have a, I've drawn a red line down the peak of each of these fringes and just as you move down vertically measuring the separation just through the, the Bragg relation um, you can convert pixel into, into velocity um, and then at the bottom you can see I've compared it for a few different um, iterations of the experiment with different slits and when you normalize everything you see that there's a, a uniform flux over the entire um, diffraction mass. So, in a slightly different um, way to the, what, the, what the photon guys do, so the photon guys typically sit at the origin. So they sit, um, uh, so if these are your three slits, they sit at a position which is symmetric relative to the central one. Um, uh, it's not obvious to me that that's the best place to sit. I don't know. I don't have a model for, for how you might deviate from the, the superposition principle, how you might measure it, so I don't know what the best place to measure it would be. Right? It's, it's, it's not obvious to me. Um, so on the left, what you can see is uh, uh, um, that's the subtraction or summation of all the different interference patterns that are gathered for different slit permutations, whether I have three open or two or, or, or whatever, um, and I've, I've summed them up uh, um, to give you some value of kappa. So typically, per pixel, we had about 20 molecules um, on average, depending on which state it was, but of, of that order of magnitude. And you can see that kappa uh, varies between uh, minus, nearly minus 0.1 and 0.1. So this is not a great measurement uh, um, from a precision sort of uh, point of view. Um, on the right, you can see, just to sort of uh, uh, make it a bit easier to, to quantify, um, what I've done is I've drawn uh, um, a line right to so the top one is a, a line right down the center of the n equals zero fringe. So that's where the photon guys normally measure. Uh, uh, and that's as a function of the Borey wavelength, so on the order of about four picometers, which is about 240 meters per second. Uh, likewise, I chose just for no particular reason other than it seemed like a reasonable place to measure. Uh, um, I chose a velocity um, of about 3.5 picometers and looked at how the, the value of kappa changed as you moved uh, uh, transversely through the interference pattern. Um, and you can see, to a large extent, so, so the solid black line is the, the mean, um, and the, the, the sort of grayed out area is the standard deviation of each one of these measurements. So it seems reasonable that uh, um, it's, it's pretty consistent with zero. Um, yeah, it's pretty consistent with zero. So, now I think that uh, I want to ask you guys some questions. So um, I've probably already um, demonstrated my naivety when it comes to these sorts of uh, experiments. But I was wondering, is there anything, well, first of all, is it worth pushing these experiments any further? So this is, this is kind of a toy model. Right? It's, it's just a, a mask in a, in a beam and measure some interference patterns. Is there any way that we could do these experiments better? And is there any way that we could actually test some physical theory? Because right, at the moment everything's just empirical. We just compare a few different interference patterns and see what we get. So, um, for no physical reason um, whatsoever, I found this wave equation. So it's an alternative to the Schrodinger equation, where you have some uh, additional mm -hmm. contribution. So, uh, in fact, I've called it phi instead of psi because uh, I don't want to confuse different dynamics. Um, but here the solution is phi, and there's some additional term where uh, you have a mod squared times the actual solution to this equation as well. And that satisfies a different normalization condition. So mod phi squared integrated over all space doesn't equal one anymore. Mm -hmm. So is it conceivable that there is some dynamical equation that the solution to which, in fact, so, okay, uh, uh, phi, mod phi to the four is approximately mod psi squared, um, where for small particles, I don't know what small is necessarily, but you know, it needs to be consistent with 
measurements we've already made in quantum mechanics. Is there any way that some sort of dynamics, dynamical system like this could um, be a better description of, of, of nature in any way? Uh, that, that, that's what I'm thinking. Um, <coughs> so yeah, um, the, the questions I really have are, so can we probe dynamics from the Schrodinger equation by testing the superposition principle? Is there some um, extension to these experiments where, whereby we can say anything interesting? Um, are there any nonlinear wave equations that don't conflict with the, the rest of physics? So I think, is it the Schrodinger-Newton equation that violates causality? I know that there are a number of problems um, with a lot of nonlinear systems. Um, I don't know. I don't know what a lot of these are. Um, if any of you do, it would be very interesting to hear them. Um, if there are some experiments that we can do, uh, uh, sorry, if there are some nonlinear um, wave equations that we could test, What's the best way to do this? So how 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 would we do this experiment? Remembering that it's the slits themselves are quite difficult to deal with. So we have all sorts of interactions um, that, are, that are hard to get under control. So I didn't mention this too much, but the the choice of molecule that we used is because it has a, a, a relatively low dipole moment. So the the casimir polar or the van der Waals interaction of these molecules as they pass through the slits um, can have complicated um, effects on the interference plans. So it's not always easy to predict what they're going to do. So is there some way that we can do this with outer slit, for example? So if you want to do it with photons, you can just instead of, you could replace each slit with a two-level atom, for example, and then you don't have to worry about any sort of diffraction effects or, or, or edge effects. So is there some sort of system that we can, we can come up with to do that? Um, and then the final one, I guess, is a bit I'm not really sure about this. So the, the sorts of loop trajectories I showed before. Have, have these sorts of exotic paths already been observed in any experiments indirectly? Um, so maybe no one's ever sat down with three slits and, 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 and measured it. Sorry, this is probably very stupid, but could it be that when you add them all up, they cancel out? They just, just destructively interfere, or it's no. impossible. If they exist, they must be observable at the, uh, at the level of with, one square. With three Let's slits. say with three. Okay. With two slits, then they don't, uh, they don't all add up. They will always give you some yeah. deviation to. I see. So you can't have that the phases go no. exactly add up to zero no. somehow. Doesn't seem to be. Okay. Hmm. But, but it's not obvious at all. I don't yeah. even know how to add them up, by the way. It's uh, I can send you the some okay, original definitely. papers by Kubi. Uh, okay. I, I can send you the original papers. He does the full calculation. Full, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, um, in fact, he does it slightly differently. So he does it for a double slit experiment. Um, With all just, the yeah. I see why, but, but it's the same. Yeah, it should be the same. Yeah, it should be the same. Um, yeah. So I mean, it may well be that these paths have already been indirectly observed. They're already in regular quantum mechanics. I don't know. And uh, more importantly, is it worth looking? So, would it be interesting to do an experiment, yeah. perhaps with slits, perhaps with a? Uh, so I have some cold clouds of lithium lying around. Would it be worth dropping them through <laughs> some slits to see what it does? I, I, I don't know. I don't know what the. What the mean theory, other than quantum theory, to test it against. So, what about dynamical collapse theories? Yes, maybe. Um, of which there are many. You, uh, if you could guide me into to well, <laughs> how to do this, that would be very interesting. I don't um, know about those. Um, I mean, David has spent many years studying that. <laughs> 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 I'm trying, trying to avoid studying. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so, but so. you're not worried about superluminal signaling. I am worried about superluminal mm -hmm. signaling. So, mm -hmm. so, so any nonlinearity yes. will give you superluminal. Is that true? Is that is that uh, so any? Mm -hmm. But it, uh, if I have a well, the Gross Pitiesky Gross equation is nonlinear, right? And that doesn't give you superluminal signaling. There's no. I mean, but that's a self-consistent solution mm -hmm. for many particles, right? The, the true equation is. It's true as an order parameter rather than a <coughs> wave function, but. So is that right? Uh, so all, any, any nonlinear wave equation will always give you subluminal signals. Polchinski had the result saying you have the option of replacing that with communication between branches of the wave function. Mm -hmm. That you had to have one or the other. I see. Mm -hmm. So this is why I'm asking this question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it worth trying to measure these things? No, I have prejudice that quantum mechanics is correct. So, <laughs> and so uh, uh, I, think, I, think I, I think I agree with your prejudice. That doesn't, that doesn't mean that. Uh, yeah, yeah, was I remember Nikola right? was quite uh, was presenting this kind of experiment. I was kind of. Well, why spending time and whatever? It's for me. It's I think Simon's right. Actually, Simon has a, a theorem that in any 
if, if, if it's evolution of the wave function that we're talking about when we say linear or nonlinear, yeah. then any nonlinear modification of Schrodinger would lead to yeah, but there is the assumption that nothing else changes. Um, yeah. uh, that, that your your concepts of entangled because you need a uh, entanglement at a distance that's of course everything else is supposed um, to be yeah. exactly the same yeah. but right. but this kind of modification uh, uh, leaves you with an inconsistent uh, uh, formalism. Well, so, you, so you, you just create a mess. You cannot just you cannot, just, you cannot change one piece. such element in the quantum formalism without changing many others to... to uh, yes, that's the, the problem. Yeah. 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 Bell's inequality yeah. is a problem automatically yeah. different yeah. as well. Yeah. If you go I, I don't know whether the Gitter yeah. argument survives if you... If, yeah, it's if, not if, if you, I mean, well, incorporate yeah. all, the, all the modifications yeah. that you need to have another consistent formula. Yeah. So people have um, thought about ideas, for example, how you might have a reasonable theory mm -hmm. that generates, let's say, higher order interference. Yes. And so people like to speculate that there could be something that has some higher order interference yes. called it maybe um, maybe it, it decoheres through some higher order decoherence process to quantum and, and that's why in our experiments we've done we only see quantum yeah. and, and not these sort of decohered out higher order effects. So yeah, it's a speculation, but um, it's certainly if someone constructed such a thing, it would seem to so, so give a much stronger motivation yeah. to these kinds of things. So these models already exist. So uh, um, these models already exist in a in a sort of rigorous way. People have written down, or they've just no, 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 no. I mean, no one's managed to. That's that's the problem. I actually I worked on this for a bit. I mean, I was exploring one particular idea, which mm -hmm. so far hasn't worked out. Um, which was this. In, in quantum, if you think about the group of reversible transformations mm -hmm. of a single system, um, s strictly I would say it's the projective unitary group, but we could say it's SUD, which, which is near enough. Now how does SUD act on a quantum state? If you think of the density matrix, it transforms as rho goes to u times rho times u dagger. That's a particular representation of SUD. Mm -hmm. Particular representation of the of the abstract group. It actually reduces into something called the adjoint representation, mm -hmm. and another one D piece that just carries the normalization of the. Mm -hmm. So the the idea which a few people explored, um, including me, was: what if we make a theory which is still SUD, but through some higher dimensional representation, just have a higher acting on the, the the thing that represents the state in that theory. Um, and could something like that have higher involvement interference? And you didn't, you didn't manage to solve it? We didn't manage to construct one that well, well, that's it's self consistent with. Exactly, it's, it's got to have rules for combining yeah. systems and they have to work. And so, so, is it um, um, Scott Aronson, mm -hmm. uh, the guy who did the boson sampling stuff? He has this theory that Born's rule is somehow this island of stability for physics and mm -hmm. something inherently special about it, right? Is that. Well, there's something in that. It's, it's, it's really hard it's to construct other things that don't just become inconsistent or yeah. fall to bits or something. But now you said the Schrodinger equation was the same island, right? Because if you tweak it a bit, you yeah, get somewhere. So yeah. anything is like that in, in a good physical but, theory. But yeah. somehow, somehow they're intimately related, right? Because the, yeah, same, you know, the Schrodinger equation has to satisfy Born's rule, so it's, uh, yes, yes. you always come back to yes, it. But I guess any stuff. bit you tweak, you will have a problem. Right. Well, but I, I guess that's my question. Is that is that true? If you if you move away even slightly from the Schrodinger equation of Born's rule, or however you want to think about it, um, well, how, is it, is it possible to move at all and still have something that doesn't conflict with everything else that you see? If I come up with anything else, let me know. <laughs> but I mean, are these uh, uh, beyond sort of like the toy model interference experiments that I've already done? Is this something that? even empirically speaking, is interesting to keep measuring? I think so, especially this collapse motivation. I mean, it's, it's a genuine question. I think, I think for the collapse stuff, you have to go very big, though. Right? Uh, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Marcus is 10,000. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, he's not here now, I can say it. You know, that experiment is like balancing shares, right? Mm. Uh, 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 mm. It's a lot of work to get it, you know, you have to constantly be tweaking it to, to, to do these sorts of experiments. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. If anybody thinks of anything, <laughs> let me know.
Yeah. So there's a guy, Thomas Galley, in uh, UCL, who's, okay. who's done work along these directions. Thomas Galley. Thomas Galley, yeah. Um, is it, I, I can't remember the details. This is this guy or the... Yeah, yeah this is a hunt. Lewis, Lewis Sarnes and Thomas Galley wrote a paper on what I okay. was just talking about. But I, I don't think they sort of get higher order interference or, or talk about it. Chaslav <coughs> had um, hmm. something, uh, the name yes. was density... Density cubes. Density cubes, that's the one, then. yes. Uh, is there any merit in that? Is that, is that consistent? I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of cube, but it's not really a theory. He, he doesn't say what the set of states that a system can have is or anything like that. He just sort of randomly puts numbers on a cube. Yeah. Um, and then says, it's mathematically consistent, so. Do a measurement like this. Uh -huh. Okay. But this is to represent again three point. Is, is that the idea? You need a cube as an extra dimension. That must yeah. be the, the octagonal is like yeah. I understand. So well, instead of three. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, that's hard. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time working on this problem too and uh, I waste a lot of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. That's somehow reassuring, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. 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 Thank you.